If a man preach the golden rule as a sound rule of conduct, his words will fall upon deaf ears if he does not practice that which he preaches. The most effective sermon that any man can preach on the soundness of the golden rule is that which he preaches by suggestion when he applies this rule in his relationships with his fellow men. If a salesman of Ford automobiles drives up to his prospective purchaser in a Buick or some other make of car, all the arguments he can present in behalf of the Ford will be without effect. Once I went into one of the offices of the dictaphone company to look at a dictaphone, dictating machine. The salesman in charge presented a logical argument as to the machine's merits, while the stenographer at his side was transcribing letters from a shorthand notebook. His arguments in favor of a dictating machine, as compared with the old method of dictating to a stenographer, did not impress me because his actions were not in harmony with his words. Your thoughts constitute the most important of the three ways in which you apply the principle of suggestion, for the reason that they control the tone of your words and, to some extent at least, your actions. If your thoughts and your actions and your words harmonize, you are bound to influence those with whom you come in contact, more or less toward your way of thinking. We will now proceed to analyze the subject of suggestion and to show you exactly how to apply the principle upon which it operates. As we have already seen, suggestion differs from auto-suggestion only in one way. We use it, consciously or unconsciously, when we influence others, while we use auto-suggestion as a means of influencing ourselves. Before you can influence another person through suggestion, that person's mind must be in a state of neutrality, that is, it must be open and receptive to your method of suggestion. Right here is where most salesmen fail. They try to make a sale before the mind of the prospective buyer has been rendered receptive or neutralized. This is such a vital point in this lesson that I feel impelled to dwell upon it until there can be no doubt that you understand the principle that I am describing. When I say that the salesman must neutralize the mind of his prospective purchaser before a sale can be made, I mean that the prospective purchaser's mind must be credulous. A state of confidence must have been established and it is obvious that there can be no set rule for either establishing confidence or neutralizing the mind to a state of openness. Here, the ingenuity of the salesman must apply that which cannot be set down as a hard and fast rule. I know a life insurance salesman who sells nothing but large policies, amounting to $100,000 and upward. Before this man even approaches the subject of insurance with a prospective client, he familiarizes himself with the prospective client's complete history, including his education, his financial status, his eccentricities, if he has any, his religious preferences, and other data too numerous to be listed. Armed with this information, he manages to secure an introduction under conditions which permit him to know the prospective client in a social as well as a business way. Nothing is said about the sale of life insurance during the first visit, nor his second, and sometimes he does not approach the subject of insurance until he has become very well acquainted with the prospective client. All this time, however, he is not dissipating his efforts. He is taking advantage of these friendly visits for the purpose of neutralizing his prospective client's mind. That is, he is building up a relationship of confidence, so that when the time comes for him to talk life insurance, that which he says will fall upon ears that willingly listen. Some years ago I wrote a book entitled How to Sell Your Services. Just before the manuscript went to the publisher, it occurred to me to request some of the well-known men of the United States to write letters of endorsement to be published in the book. The printer was then waiting for the manuscript. Therefore, I hurriedly wrote a letter to some eight or ten men, in which I briefly outlined exactly what I wanted, but the letter brought back no replies. I had failed to observe two important prerequisites for success. I had written the letter so hurriedly that I had failed to inject the spirit of enthusiasm into it, and I had neglected so to word the letter that it had the effect of neutralizing the minds of those to whom it was sent. Therefore, I had not paved the way for the application of the principle of suggestion. After I discovered my mistake, I then wrote a letter that was based upon strict application of the principle of suggestion. And this letter not only brought back replies from all to whom it was sent, but many of the replies were masterpieces and served, far beyond my fondest hopes, as valuable supplements to the book. For the purpose of comparison, to show you how the principle of suggestion may be used in writing a letter and what an important part enthusiasm plays in giving the written word flesh, the two letters are here reproduced. 
it will not be necessary to indicate which letter failed, as that will be quite obvious. My dear Mr. Ford, I am just completing a manuscript for a new book entitled How to Sell Your Services. I anticipate the sale of several hundred thousand of these books, and I believe those who purchased the book would welcome the opportunity of receiving a message from you as to the best method of marketing personal services. Would you therefore be good enough to give me a few minutes of your time by writing a brief message to be published in my book? This will be a big favor to me personally, and I know it would be appreciated by the readers of the book. Thanking you in advance for any consideration you may care to show me, I am yours very truly. Honorable Thomas R. Marshall, Vice President of the United States, Washington, D.C. My dear Mr. Marshall, would you care for the opportunity to send a message of encouragement and possibly a word of advice to a few hundred thousand of your fellow men who have failed to make their mark in the world as successfully as you have done? I have about completed a manuscript for a book to be entitled How to Sell Your Services. The main point made in the book is that service rendered is cause and the pay envelope is effect, and that the latter varies in proportion to the efficiency of the former. The book would be incomplete without a few words of advice from a few men who, like yourself, have come up from the bottom to enviable positions in the world. Therefore, if you will write me of your views as to the most essential points to be borne in mind by those who are offering personal services for sale, I will pass your message on through my book, which will ensure its getting into hands where it will do a world of good for a class of earnest people who are struggling to find their places in the world's work. I know you are a busy man, Mr. Marshall, but please bear in mind that by simply calling in your secretary and dictating a brief letter, you will be sending forth an important message to possibly half a million people. In money, this will not be worth to you the two-cent stamp that you will place on the letter, but if estimated from the viewpoint of the good it may do others who are less fortunate than yourself, it may be worth the difference between success and failure to many a worthy person who will read your message, believe in it, and be guided by it. Very cordially yours. Now, let us analyze the two letters and find out why one failed in its mission while the other succeeded. This analysis should start with one of the most important fundamentals of salesmanship, namely motive. In the first letter, it is obvious that the motive is entirely one of self-interest. The letter states exactly what is wanted, but the wording of it leaves a doubt as to why the request is made or whom it is intended to benefit. Study the sentence in the second paragraph. This will be a big favor to me personally, etc. Now, it may seem to be a peculiar trait, but the truth is that most people will not grant favors just to please others. If I ask you to render a service that will benefit me without bringing you some corresponding advantage, you will not show much enthusiasm in granting that favor. You may refuse altogether if you have a plausible excuse for refusing. But if I ask you to render a service that will benefit a third person, even though the service must be rendered through me, and if that service is of such a nature that it is likely to reflect credit on you, the chances are that you will render the service willingly. We see this psychology demonstrated by the man who pitches a dime to the beggar on the street, or perhaps refuses even the dime, but willingly hands over a hundred or a thousand dollars to the charity worker who is begging in the name of others. But the most damaging suggestion of all is contained in the last and most important paragraph of the letter. Thanking you in advance for any consideration you may care to show me. This sentence strongly suggests that the writer of the letter anticipates a refusal of his request. It clearly indicates lack of enthusiasm. It paves the way for a refusal of the request. There is not one single word in the entire letter that places in the mind of a man to whom it is sent a satisfactory reason why he should comply with the request. On the other hand, he can clearly see that the object of the letter is to secure from him a letter of endorsement that will help sell the book. The most important selling argument, in fact the only selling argument available in connection with this request, has been lost because it was not brought out and established as the real motive for making the request. This argument was but faintly mentioned in the sentence, I believe those who purchased the book would welcome the opportunity of receiving a message from you as to the best method of marketing personal services. The opening paragraph of the letter violates an important fundamental of salesmanship because it clearly suggests that the object of the letter is to gain some advantage for its writer. 
and does not even hint at any corresponding advantage that may accrue to the person to whom it is sent. Instead of neutralizing the mind of the recipient of the letter as it should do, it has just the opposite effect. It causes him to close his mind against all argument that follows. It puts him in a frame of mind that makes it easy for him to say no. It reminds me of a salesman, or perhaps I should say a man who wanted to be a salesman, who once approached me for the purpose of selling me a subscription to the Saturday Evening Post. As he held a copy of the magazine in front of me, he suggested the answer I should make by this question. You wouldn't subscribe for the Post to help me out, would you? Of course I said no. He had made it easy for me to say no. There was no enthusiasm back of his words, and gloom and discouragement were written all over his face. He needed the commission he would have made on my subscription, had I purchased, no doubt about that, but he suggested nothing that appealed to my self-interest motive. Therefore he lost a sale. But the loss of this one sale was not the sad part of his misfortune. The sad part was that this same attitude was causing him to lose all other sales which he might have made had he changed his approach. A few weeks later another subscription agent approached me. She was selling a combination of six magazines, one of which was the Saturday Evening Post. But how different was her approach? She glanced at my library table, on which she saw several magazines, then at my bookshelves, and exclaimed with enthusiasm, Oh, I see you are a lover of books and magazines. I proudly pleaded guilty to the charge. Observe the word proudly, for it has an important bearing on this incident. I laid down the manuscript that I was reading when this saleswoman came in, for I could see that she was a woman of intelligence. Just how I came to see this I will leave to your imagination. The important point is that I laid down the manuscript and actually felt myself wanting to hear what she had to say. With the aid of eleven words, plus a pleasant smile, plus a tone of genuine enthusiasm, she had neutralized my mind sufficiently to make me want to hear her. She had performed her most difficult task with those few words, because I had made up my mind when she was announced, that I would keep my manuscript in my hands and thereby convey to her mind, as politely as I could, the fact that I was busy and did not wish to be detained. Being a student of salesmanship and of suggestion, I carefully watched to see what her next move would be. She had a bundle of magazines under her arm, and I expected she would unroll it and begin to urge me to purchase, but she didn't. You will recall that I said she was selling a combination of six magazines, not merely trying to sell them. She walked over to my bookshelves, pulled out a copy of Emerson's essays, and for the next ten minutes she talked about Emerson's essay on compensation so interestingly that I lost sight of the roll of magazines that she carried. She was neutralizing my mind some more. Incidentally, she gave me a sufficient number of new ideas about Emerson's works to provide material for an excellent editorial. Then she asked me which magazines I received regularly, and after I told her, she smiled as she began to unroll her bundle of magazines and laid them on the table in front of me. She analyzed her magazines one by one and explained just why I should have each of them. The Saturday Evening Post would bring me the cleanest fiction. Literary Digest would bring me the news of the world in condensed form, such as a busy man like myself would demand. The American Magazine would bring me the latest biographies of the men who were leading in business and industry, and so on, until she had covered the entire list. But I was not responding to her argument as freely as she thought I should have, so she slipped me this gentle suggestion. A man of your position is bound to be well informed, and if he isn't it will show up in his own work. She spoke the truth. Her remark was both a compliment and a gentle reprimand. She made me feel somewhat sheepish, because she had taken inventory of my reading matter, and six of the leading magazines were not on my list, the six that she was selling. Then I began to slip by asking her how much the six magazines would cost. She put on the finishing touches of a well-presented sales talk by this tactful reply. The cost? Why... The cost of the entire number is less than you receive for a single page of the typewritten manuscript that you had in your hands when I came in. Again she spoke the truth. And how did she happen to guess so well what I was getting for my manuscript? The answer is, she didn't guess, she knew. She made it a part of her business to draw me out tactfully as to the nature of my work, which in no way made me angry. She became so deeply interested in the manuscript which I had laid down when she came in that she actually induced me to talk about it. 
I am not saying, of course, that this required any great amount of skill or coaxing, for have I not said that it was my manuscript? In my remarks about that manuscript, I suspect I admitted that I was receiving two hundred and fifty dollars for the fifteen pages. Yes, I am sure I was careless enough to admit that I was being well paid for my work. Perhaps she induced me to make the admission. At any rate, the information was valuable to her, and she made effective use of it at the psychological moment. For all I know, it was a part of her plan to observe carefully all that she saw and heard, with the object of finding out just what my weaknesses were, and what I was most interested in discussing. Some salesmen take the time to do this, some do not. She was one of those who did. Yes, she went away with my order for the six magazines, also my twelve dollars. But that was not all the benefit she derived from tactful suggestion plus enthusiasm. She got my consent to canvas my office, and before she left, she had five other orders from my employees. At no time during her stay did she leave the impression that I was favoring her by purchasing her magazines. Just to the contrary, she distinctly impressed me with the feeling that she was rendering me a favor. This was tactful suggestion. Before we get away from this incident, I wish to make an admission. When she drew me into conversation, she did it in such a way that I talked with enthusiasm. There were two reasons for this. She was one of them, and the other one was the fact that she managed to get me to talk about my own work. Of course, I am not suggesting that you should be meddlesome enough to smile at my carelessness as you read this, or that you should gather from this incident the impression that this tactful saleswoman actually led me to talk of my own work for the purpose of neutralizing my mind so that I would listen to her when she was ready to talk of her magazines as patiently as she had listened to me. However, if you should be clever enough to draw a lesson from her method, there is no way for me to stop you from doing so. First impressions really do count. Dress to look the part you intend to play in life, but take care not to overdo it. A careful inventory of all your past experiences may disclose the startling fact that everything has happened for the best. As I have stated, when I talked I mixed enthusiasm with my conversation. Perhaps I caught the spirit of enthusiasm from this clever saleswoman when she made that opening remark as she came into my study. Yes, I am sure this is where I caught it, and I am just as sure that her enthusiasm was not a matter of accident. She had trained herself to look for something in her prospective purchaser's office or his work or his conversation over which she could express enthusiasm. Remember, suggestion and enthusiasm go hand in hand. I can remember as though it were yesterday the feeling that came over me when that would-be salesman pushed that Saturday evening post in front of me as he remarked, You wouldn't subscribe for the post to help me out, would you? His words were chilled. They were lifeless. They lacked enthusiasm. They registered an impression in my mind, but that impression was one of coldness. I wanted to see the man go out at the door at which he had come in. Mind you, I am not naturally unsympathetic, but the tone of his voice, the look on his face, his general bearing suggested that he was there to ask a favor and not to offer one. Suggestion is one of the most subtle and powerful principles of psychology. You are making use of it in all that you do and say and think, but unless you understand the difference between negative suggestion and positive suggestion, you may be using it in such a way that it is bringing you defeat instead of success. 